Hey guys, and welcome to the Danger Zone. Maverick and Goose signing on. Just kidding, it's just us, Amanda and Gabby from Completely Booked. And we're here at the library, which is possibly the opposite of the Danger Zone. Today, we have a very cool guest joining us. David, call sign bio, Veronic. Dave is one of the few that can be considered to be among the elite Top Gun squadron. Although during the interview, you will see he is very humble about his accolades. Dave has reached heights not many do. While serving as a Top Gun air-to-air combat instructor in 1985, he also had the unusual experience of flying aerial sequences used in the film Top Gun, pretty much every 80s kid's favorite action film, starring Tom Cruise and produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson. He also served as a dialogue advisor on the project and took some of the few available photographs of the movie's black F-5 fighters in flight. Spoiler alert, if you tune into the podcast, you'll hear stories about Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer. In addition to helping out with Top Gun, he also enjoyed a successful and satisfying 20-year career in the Navy and has penned two memoirs with another on the way. So without further delay, buckle up and enjoy the flight. Er, podcast. No, no, ma'am, this is not a good idea. Sorry, Goose, but it's time to buzz the tower. So we are here with Dave Bio-Baronic. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your education? Uh, all right. Since uh, we're here in Jacksonville, I will admit that I was born in, here in Jacksonville and uh, grew up here and actually came to the old library occasionally to look at the books <laughs> and to hang out with friends and stuff like that. Uh, I went to high school here. I went to uh, Bishop Kenny uh, High School. And then uh, when I went to college, I went up to Atlanta to Georgia Tech. And around the time I was about uh, 10 years old, I knew I wanted to fly airplanes. I wanted to fly jet fighters. So, I mean, once I decided that, I never changed my mind. That was the one, that was the goal that stuck. You know, before that, I had various things that I thought I wanted to do and stuff. And then uh, as I was graduating from high school, it just became a question of whether I wanted to go Air Force or Navy. And uh, from talking to my dad, just, you know, just a short conversation with him, I decided to go Navy. Not, you know, nothing wrong with the Air Force, of course, but I just picked the Navy. And that turned out to be a good decision for me because uh, my eyesight went bad when I was in college. And it was not from studying. It was, and, uh, Why did it go bad? Just natural you know, aging. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, I didn't, I tried to study, but I just, I just got through college. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, and so uh, luckily, and I wanted to fly fighters and you could not be a fighter pilot if you don't have 20, 20 vision. So I could not be a pilot because because I had to wear glasses. But the Navy was making this new airplane called the F-14. It was a two-seat airplane. The back seater could wear glasses. And so that became my goal. And that's what I ended up doing. That's very cool. So what were some of the different roles that you held while you were in the Navy? Oh, um, so the first thing that you do, I'll just go chronologically. The first thing that you do is you're a student for about, uh, depends on on what pro- what program, but anywhere from one to two years. And for pilots, it's a little bit longer because they have more things to learn. But you're a student with very few other responsibilities. And then uh, after that, you join, you go to another squadron where you learn about your specific airplane, still a student. And then when you join your actual squadron, and for aviation, it's squadrons, for uh, for ship drivers, it's a ship, and for submariners, it's, you know, submarine, but it's all very, very similar. You have uh, two, uh, col- you know, uh, parallel responsibilities. One is your warfare warfare responsibilities. So for me, it was learning to fly the F-14, practicing and all that. But also, uh, we ran the squadron and managed the squadron. So I was what's called a branch officer. I was the first officer in the chain of command for about uh, 15 or 20 young sailors. <clears throat> now, I, I didn't tell them what to do to work. They had a, a first class or a chief telling them that. But I was their first officer who reviewed their records and stuff like that. And I, I didn't, even though they told us about that in college and, and, uh, and in high school, I took junior ROTC, so, which, which I liked when I was in high school. But even though they told us about that, I didn't give it much thought. But I realized that this was, for me, one of the fun parts of the job. You know, I liked meeting these guys and uh, I liked working with them and stuff like that. So... So that really uh, made it a a more full experience. But, you know, of course, the main thing that I liked was flying jets. 
So, and, and as a backseater or Rio, I did not actually fly the plane, but I, flying in jets, flying jets. Uh, so then, uh, you, uh, after you're in the squadron for a couple of years, you get a, a job with more responsibility and then, uh, but, but you're basically, you, you spend part of your time running the squadron and the other part of the time flying and, and learning the flying mission. So then after that, I rotated to an instructor job, and that's where I was a Top Gun instructor. Went back to a squadron, uh, had more jobs running the squadron. Then I went to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, where I was on the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, staff for a few years, and that was pretty cool. Not, not uh, at the time, it was, it was not fun, but, you know, it was a cool experience in retrospect. And uh, then at the end of my career, I ended up going back to flying and uh, was the commanding officer of an F-14 squadron. So your call sign is BIO. Can you tell us how you got that? Yes, my call sign is BIO, B-I-O. And uh, when I was a junior off, when I was an ensign just finishing the training, they actually ask you, what do you want your call sign to be? And so guys were coming up with, you know, shark and killer and and clever names and stuff, you know, whatever. And I was thinking, okay, this, and the year was 1981. And so everybody had watched the $6 million man. The word bionic was very familiar. And so my last name, Baronic, rhymes with bionic. So I said, I want my call sign to be bionic. So I talked to this guy whose call sign was Superman Jones. His name was Superman, or his call sign was Superman. And, and that's a good call sign. And he was, a, he was a good guy. And he goes, yeah, I think that's a good one. You ought to go with that. So I got to my squadron and here I am, an ensign, I was six foot two and 165 pounds. So I was very skinny and I'm saying, you know, I want to be called bionic. <laughs> and the pilot that I was flying with, he goes, I'm, I'm not going to call you bionic, you know? So he, sh- he shortened it to bio and that stuck and I took it. And some call signs are very clever. Some of them are insulting. Some of them, you know, you can't, I can't explain, you know, the reason. So bio is like a neutral call sign. It's like, okay. It's very like cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I read it, I was like, that's a cool call sign. It's good. It's. I it's feel like neutral. it's hard to pick your own too. It, if you really sit down and think about it, like. Oh yeah. Don't. Yeah. Well, and, and the other, I worked, I've worked with Air Force guys and I believe, uh, I'm not the expert, but I believe a lot of Air Force squadrons have a f- call sign naming ceremony. Okay. And in Navy squadrons, uh, it's a lot more uh, random and uh, and just you know what however it develops. A new guy shows up in the squadron and everybody goes, oh, he looks like you know somebody on TV or something. So your call sign is so and so resemble you know, and and also call signs can change. And that, that's what I was about to ask. Can you change your call sign if you're like five years in and you're like that just doesn't suit me anymore? Uh, a few guys have kind of push to for their own call sign change but usually if you try to change it you'll just get you know made fun of and your original call signs get a stick you know even more so it's you know you can think of it as harassment um but you know that's an ugly way to put call it bonding because everybody gets it you know the guys that are harassing you they got it when they were new and plus it's kind of superficial you know uh, yes, there, I know that there can be ugly call signs and, and that, uh, so, so there have to be some limits. Were you ever jealous of somebody else's call sign? Were you like, why didn't I think of that one? Uh, well, okay. I'll tell you this and, and clever people who are listening and people have pointed this out to me, Baronic also rhymes with moronic. <laughs> and so, and so I was happy that I didn't get, you know, moron or something like that. And then also, uh, I had a younger brother who flew and his call sign for a short period of time was shark. And that's a cool call sign, but I'm going, yeah, he, he can have it. You know, he's cool. He de- he earned it. <laughs> so. So that brings us to Top Gun. You're an aerial combat instructor at yes. Top Gun. At, at the Top Gun squadron. Yes. And then this movie comes about. How did that experience come about? Uh, it was it being in the right place at the right time. They, um, you know, I, I could uh, try to be funny and say, oh, they saw me. And, but, but really, I was just in the right place at the right time. The movie was based on a magazine article uh, and, and uh, that came out around 1982 or 83. I, uh, and Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer saw the article. They thought it would make a good movie. And so they had to do their homework. Uh, they had to get Navy approval, write a script and all this stuff. And so one day they showed up to the Top Gun Squadron uh, or black limousine with a bunch of people. They they first started out by visiting the Admiral on the base, but we all heard about it right away. 
And at that time, I had been a Top Gun Squadron uh, instructor for about six months, eight months. And I'd been at, at Miramar, the base in San Diego. I'd been there for, you know, four years. And there had been TV shows and productions before, and it never made a big deal. So I'm thinking, oh, this is just another one, you know, big deal. It's not going to go anywhere. Well, then we start reading about it in the San Diego paper, Tom Cruise, who we really didn't know who he was back then. In 19, so the movie was filmed in 1985. Okay. So, and so they showed up at the base in 85. I'm going to say 84. And the movie was filmed in 85. And Tom Cruise was not that famous. So bottom line is they just decided to make the movie. You know, it was big to them, Paramount. It was a major effort. They had top level people on it. They did everything they needed to do to make it a good movie. And there were 16 of us Top Gun instructors who were cited in the credits. And we were just there at the right time. And we all flew in the movie. We all talked to the uh, actors and the screenwriters and stuff. So everybody contributed. So for reference, you were the goose stuntman. Uh, uh, (laughs) No, I, I was not Goose. I um, uh, Certain people have claimed that they were the inspiration for a character or something, but actually the, uh, the screenwriters, they went around to flight briefings, they went to ready rooms, and they hung out and they talked to a lot of people and they took a lot of notes. And so they just worked these things in. You know, the characters were an amalgamation uh, of, of a lot of people. And so the first book that you published is called uh, Top Gun Days, Dogfighting, Cheating Death, and Hollywood Glory is One of America's Best Fighter Jocks. That sounds like a lot of chaos. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about the Top Gun Days? Yes. Um, my book, I, I was driving home from work uh, after I retired, and I thought I would write a magazine article about filming the movie. And after about a minute, I said, no, I'm going to write a book. And so I went home and I, I told my wife this great idea and she goes, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, you need, you need a hobby. So, <laughs> so I started writing the book and as soon as I gave it any thought, I thought of the opening line for the book and I thought of the title Top Gun Days. So then I, you know, just started writing this book. It took a few years. Uh, it was pretty much fun for me. It was fun to do this. I mean, it was it's not everybody's idea of fun, but I enjoyed, I did a lot of research on, on my flying, on the movie, on the airplanes. I contacted old friends and stuff like that. So I, I had a, you know, a good time putting this all together. And then to get it published, I got a literary agent and he goes, Dave, you need a subtitle. And so my literary agent is the guy who thought of dogfighting, cheating death and Hollywood glory. And he first had as one of America's best fighter pilots. And I said, you know, Robert, the rest of it, I, I accepted it. I go, you know, that's kind of out there. And he goes, hey, it's like a carnival barker. You know, you're trying to get people's attention. So he goes, just go with it. And I said, okay. And I told him, though, you can't call me a pilot. So he changed it to a fighter jock and that stuck. And then, um, yeah. And, and you know, I hope people know that it's a little bit tongue in cheek. But, you know, as a Top Gun instructor, we were, we were good. There's a lot of good pilots and, and Rios in the in the uh, in the Navy, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it like to be considered uh, part of the elite Top Gun squadron? Oh, it's uh, that that's a hard thing to to put into words. I mean, you know, one thing that it it does is it's uh, it kind of I hate to say this, but one you got to accept it as elite yourself in order for it to mean something. Okay. So I go back to before I was a Top Gun instructor, what I thought of these guys. And I said, oh, these guys, you know, they, they work very hard. They have high standards. So I would like to be one of them. And then when I became one, I said, okay, I'm here. And it's, it's very, it's very demanding. And we'll we'll talk about that in just a minute. If, let me write these words down. Okay. Uh, uh, But to be one, it kind of validates the hard work that you put in because Top Gun instructors, when I was there, we, we put in a lot of hours and now they, uh, I think they work even harder because uh, we just had, we had the 50th anniversary reunion in San Diego a few months ago and the current instructors gave us a little rundown on what they're doing. And I'm sitting there going like, man, this, it just, because, because air combat becomes more and more complicated all the time. And I was an instructor 35 years ago. And so it's become a lot more complicated since then. Right. Um, what is your favorite aerial move? <laughs> Easy question. 
My favorite aerial move is called the rudder reversal. Do you have a model airplane on a stick that I can use? <laughs> oh, you don't? Okay, so I'll use my hands. So, uh, and this is a move that the F-14, it was not recommended for the F-14. And what it involves is the aircraft going roughly 70 degrees nose up. You get a certain airspeed. And I'll describe the procedures for the F-5, uh, which, which we had the, I flew in the two-seat F-5, F-5F Tiger II. At, uh, as the airspeed starts to, uh, to slow down, whatever the numbers were, and I've got them written in the book, you lower flaps to maneuver. And I flew this myself as the backseater. Lowered the flaps to maneuver as, as you get to like 100 knots. So you start at around 300, you climb, you allow it to decelerate, you get to about 100 knots, and you push hard left rudder, which starts the nose to come around like this, and then you've got to push forward and right stick, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, this may be all abstract to you, but if you're flying a plane, you will, it makes sense. And the plane pirouettes like this and pointed down. And as it points down, you've got to get ready to start flying again. So you raise the flaps, center the controls, blah, blah, blah. And the cool thing was that, uh, that even though as a back seater, I was not in the F-14, there's no flight controls in the back seat. So I never flew the F-14. In the Top Gun jets, we had flight controls in the back. But that wasn't part of my duties. But the pilots realized that if the backseaters got to fly some, they would have better understanding, which is true. So a guy talked me through a rudder reversal. First time I did it, didn't do it right. We're coming around like this and we flip over on our back and the plane goes out of control. But in the F-5, being out of control is not a big deal. The engines are reliable. The controls are straightforward. You neutralize the controls and it starts to fly around again. So he goes, okay, bio, what you did is you, you didn't feed in enough stick. So next time put in more, you know, so we went up and did it again. And as we're going over like this from feedback in the controls, I could feel the air fluttering over the right wing and I'm sitting there going, oh, this is cool. So we're in the F5F small, small fighter weighs like 10,000 pounds, which is small for a fighter. It's only like 40 feet long or something in third. And, and we're just flipping around the sky and you can feel the air hitting the flaps and everything. And then, you know, nose comes down, clean it up, run the thralls forward and get back in the fight. Yeah. That's not an easy thing to uh, get back in a plane after something like that happens. Oh, I, that was, that was normal. No, I was on one flight and I do describe this in the book and, and I was, so after I got qualified, I became qualified to fly with new pilots. So when new guys were flying the F-5, they took their first flight with a pilot in the back seat. And then after that, they said, okay, Bio can go in the back seat and the other Top Gun Rios also. But so I went up and flew as a pilot and I was talking him through a rudder reversal. And every time he did it, we flipped over and went out of control. <laughs> every time. And we did it like four or six times. And it's like no big deal. And the reason is that it, that it was just, we were up at, you know, 15,000 feet. We had a lot of room to fall. So that was cool. Do you consider yourself an adrenaline junkie? <laughs> I am definitely not an adrenaline junkie. I, I would have to say that I enjoyed the thrill of flying. I mean, I loved it. The, the things you see, the, uh, the, the geom I mean, the geometry and science, you know, just the physics of airplanes and then the sight of, of, uh, afterburners blazing away. I mean, to see this, this is a picture, but to see this in real life that, you know, cause I'm looking at this when I'm taking the picture, that just is a cool look and to, and, you know, and to know that, oh, my airplane's doing that too. You know, it's, it's all, uh, intellectually cool to me, but, um, but, and, and also some, some instructors are, you know, some Top Gun instructors are adrenaline junkies. I know guys, and you don't have to be an adrenaline junkie, but I know guys that, you know, they're in their, you know, late sixties, seventies, and they still go snow skiing all the time. They go, you know, water skiing with no skis, you know, barefoot water skiing. And, you know, there's guys that were parachuting and there's guys that, that own their own light planes and they go out and uh, dog fight, uh, you know, so there are guys that are adrenaline junkies. And then there's other guys that are, you know, Hung it up, you know, they sell insurance and that's it, you know. <laughs> um, part of your title is cheating death. So can you tell us um, a little bit about what it's like to like eject from a crashing aircraft? Oh, yes. Yes. 
And that was that was another um, situation that was just was like being out of control. My ejection, it it just went so well that it's like, oh, this is cool, you know. But I wasn't scared. Um, and and before I start tell the story, I'll t- I'll tell you the story. Uh, but I think about this now, and I didn't think about this stuff when I was doing it. You know, I mean, I, we, this was just what we did. But when we walked out in our flight gear with our helmet bags and we put them in the jet, you didn't walk out to that airplane and think, oh, I hope I don't get killed today. You know, that's if that's what you're thinking, you're in the wrong business. You know, you just walk out there with confidence and you own it. You go, this is what I do. So, okay, you so, want to fly. Yeah. So uh, one day, we in the, this was in the Indian Ocean. In, uh, it was December 19th, 1981, a day I'll never forget. And um, we were coming into land on the aircraft carrier at the end of a routine flight. Everything was totally normal. We came in, and hap- I was flying with the squadron commander. We were the very first airplane to land on that recovery. So, you know, every uh, two hours, they land airplanes, and they launch them and land them. It's, they, that's what the carrier does. So we were the first plane to land. We caught a cable, it slowed us down, and then I was sitting upright in my seat and I realized, oh, this isn't right. And it was, have you ever been in a car accident? Yes. So, okay, so you've probably, have you experienced the time distortion where where things happen in slow motion or whatever, however you want to say it? So this happened to me. As soon as I realized something was wrong, it's like everything instantly went into slow motion, which was really cool. And I just started having dozens of thoughts. Okay, this is an ejection handle that was on the front of your seat. And the, and as soon as I realized things were bad, I thought about holding this handle. And as soon as I thought about that, but my hands were already there. So I had reflexively grabbed this thing and I'm going, okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't fly around holding it. So we're getting to the end of the flight deck and, and I'm thinking, you know, if I pull this handle, there's no going back. The seats will fire and, and all this. And we're getting to the end of the flight deck and my pilot goes, eject, eject. And his tone of voice is like, you know, what are you waiting for? (laughs) Well, as soon as he said the first E, I pulled the handle because I knew what he was going to say. And and to this day, I admit, I don't know how long I would have waited. You know, I was just waiting. He said E, I pulled the handle. Canopy came off and our seats fired. Well, I thought I pulled the handle at a good time. But actually, this is a a picture of our actual event. Wow. Uh, A young sailor was up on the flight deck taking, just watching flight ops with his little instamatic camera and he took this picture and this we are off of the flight deck we're clear i mean we're you know and here's the cable that broke right here and as soon as we went off and and you can see the canopy and everything is still on the plane so i'm sure i already pulled the handle but it just takes you know a half second for the everything to happen and stuff like that so the plane's falling the seats come up and because of the seats are going up the plane's going down we didn't go very high so my parish my seat went up automatically reduce release me from uh release me from the seat and the parachute knows that i'm at low altitude so the parachute opens itself up and i hit the water uh uh just and, and it opened up just before i hit the water now the other thing is when my seat fired i passed out so i was out for like two seconds and to this day that is a major disappointment to me because i had always wanted if I, I if i ejected i wanted to see the plane or see everything but it's like you know I passed out. I, you couldn't help. I, I couldn't control it. So, You've only had to eject once? Only once, luckily. And so what happened to the plane? It sank. So what happened was, this is, uh, this is drawn to scale. Somehow the plane came went off to the left. And also, as soon as the, we went over to the side, the, the captain of the ship said, turn the ship to, to get it away from us. So the plane was, so I splash in the water, I pop up and I see my F-14 floating on the water right next to me. And I got to tell you, that was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen in my life. An F-14 floating on the water and the carriers going by right behind it. And I mean, it was just cool. And also I was happy to be alive. And so um, a helicopter comes, they, I had to cut myself out of my parachute, which was I, I, I had the switchblade that I used for that, but I didn't bring it because I didn't want to carry a switchblade. And, but um, I got tangled up in my parachute and I had to cut myself out of the parachute. And then the helicopter came, picked me up. And uh, when, when I got in the helicopter, uh, I heard the guys talking to each other and they go, we lost the pilot. And that was the first time since being on the flight deck that I had thought about my pilot. And I was sitting there going, oh, I killed the squadron skipper because I waited too long. And well, what they really said was we lost sight of him. And so then right away, a guy goes, no, there he is over there. 
So I'm going like, oh, good. So we went over and picked him up and he gets in the uh, helicopter and I go, I go, Skipper, we didn't do anything wrong, did we? And he goes, no bio, we had to eject. So I go, okay, good. So what happened was, uh, and I describe it in even more detail in the book. You know, it's all, or, cause I had time to think about it and make sure it all made sense. But what happened was uh, there was a trainee who was supposed to, they have to, you have to set the cables. There's four cables and you have to set it for the type of airplane that's coming into land. And the guy who was supposed to do the number four cable was a trainee and wasn't properly supervised and he didn't set it. And that's the one we caught. Huh. Wow. Scary. It's an expensive well, mistake. <laughs> well, and so, it, yeah, it is. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, back, and, and I was at, uh, I was 23 years old. I'd been in my squadron a little bit over six months, so I was kind of new. But as soon as I got out of the helicopter and everything, I was just as happy as can be because I was unharmed. We we quickly found out that, you know, it was just a strange set of circumstances that made this happen. And so I was ready to fly again. And so when I get in the uh, plane, to uh, I, I didn't fly for about four or five days while they were doing the investigation and all these formalities. And we're uh, manning up to get in the plane. And the guy that I was flying with goes, he goes, okay, now, Bio, we're probably not going to have to eject on this flight. And I, I go, okay, thanks. <laughs> he had ejected also. So that guy had. Yeah. But not everybody does. But, you know, a fair number of people do in there. And and actually, uh, fewer and fewer people do uh, all the time. And and here's something else. And, and then I'll wrap it up. On, I'll wrap up this story. But. When I went on my first deployment in 1981, this is a little bit of a grim statistic. The guys were saying, we will probably have one person killed during this deployment because around that time, one person was killed in a plane crash. Just That's just the way it worked out. And we had no one killed during that deployment. And so safety, the Naval Aviation and, and Air Force, Marine Corps and Army, all the aviation branches continue to work on safety and they just keep getting better and better. I mean, there's still risks, but it just keeps getting better. Yeah, that's good to hear because I'm even scared to fly in like a commercial plane. So, <laughs> Oh, well, I'll tell you something. You know, you talk, you talk about scared. to. Fly. I, I don't sit on a commercial plane and go, hi, I'm Dave. I used to be in for, <laughs> you know, I don't do that. But, I, was, uh, I was wondering what it's like for you to get on like just a regular plane. It's, uh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm good with it. I'm, I'm not going to spend my life, you know, wishing, oh, I, this isn't an F-4. You know, I don't, I'm not like that. But what I'm going to say is that uh, from flying in an F-14, every once in a while you get turbulence. So we'd be flying along, you know, at uh, 35,000 or whatever. And, and you just go, oh, okay. So when you're, I'm in an airliner and I go, oh, I know what this is all about. You know, and when the pilot says it's just normal turbulence, it's exactly what it is. So <laughs> People around you are, you know. Tense and <laughs> well, it is. Uh, it's also better. I mean, I you know when you have an ejection seat, afterburners, and blah blah blah. And yeah, so, control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, let's take a quick break and check in with our producer Justin. Greetings, listeners. Sunray Cinema is treating moviegoers who show their Jacksonville Public Library card at the theater's concession stand to a free small popcorn the entire month of September. This promotion is scheduled during National Library Card Senate Month and serves as a reminder of the importance of library cards. So that's free popcorn at Sunray Cinema the entire month of September by showing your library card. Back to the podcast. Um, so are there any misconceptions about the Top Gun Squadron? <laughs> Millions. Uh, <laughs> can you name a few of those? Because the movie is very, like, I, you know, very 80s, very... Oh, yeah, the movie is... Fighter, jockey. Yeah. Like, yeah. It is yeah. definitely, like, well, they, I, they do it up. I had some uh, some friends who hated the movie because they thought it was two-dimensional. And we we worked with the screenwriters, and they said, uh, look... We're making a movie. We're not making a documentary. And and we used to sit in our, uh, we would sit in the Top Gun ready room with the r raw scripts of the movie, reading them. And we'd be eating our bag lunches and guys are wearing, you know, sweaty. Actually, we didn't sweat that much, but, you know, guys are in flight suits and somebody's going, okay, 
okay, I need to go uh, practice my lecture in classroom two. Do you think they want to put that in the movie? You know, it's just, so there's a lot of, you know, legwork that goes along with being a Top Gun instructor, planning and studying and stuff. Okay. But so the movie, you know, they don't, they don't capture that. Um, and they take the, they take the characteristics and they multiply them 10 times the good and the bad. Uh, w- one of the things that they got right is kind of the mentoring uh, and that word is is used pretty often these days. But the fact where the squadron commander is at uh, Viper, yeah, I think, and he's talking to Tom Cruise, he's mentoring him. You know, there's a little bit of that going on there uh, at Top Gun. The instructors would do that if someone needed it. Uh, one of the things they got wrong was the, in my opinion, is the overt, you know, head butting uh, competition and stuff. Yes, of course, there was competition. You've got, you've got, you know, type A personalities and, but uh, people were a little, were more mature about, you know, behaving themselves and not being so obvious uh, in real life, in my experience. Um, There's no Top Gun trophy in real life. (laughs) Uh, A lot of people know this by now, but the character of Charlie was based on an actual person. But she was not an instructor at the Top Gun School, but she was uh, a scientist at the Naval Air Station. And she was, she was attractive, uh, but she was also, she was respected, you know, and people liked working with her and stuff like that. So, you know, she, she was a good person. So did you get to talk with Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer? Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Um, they, they came around the squadron a few times and they, uh, they asked us questions. I remember one day they said, somebody came up to the Top Gun ready room and they said, uh, the, these guys need to learn how to climb up into an F-14. And so I said, yeah, I'll go show them. So I took about six of the actors down in the hangar and we went to, there were, we were, Top Gun did not have F-14s at that time, but the other squadrons in the hangar did. So I went to one of their F-14s, opened it up and said, okay, here's how you do it. You know, you start with your left hand or right hand, whatever it was. And, uh, one of the more amusing times that we did was uh, they early as the filming was started, the, the Hollywood people said, hey, the actors want to hang out with you guys. So go to the Rusty Pelican at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So we all said, OK, um, you know, we'll go about uh, probably 10 or 10 Top Gun instructors, maybe in about eight or 10 actors. And we just sat there just circling around people talking to each other, telling stories and all that. And uh, we did that for about an hour before anybody came up and said, are you Tom Cruise? And the amazing thing to me is, and you know, I've got, I've got all these pictures that I took. I took no photos with the actors. I, I just didn't think of doing it. I mean, it's like one, we were not impressed with them because it's like, yeah, who are these guys? You know, we're Top Gun instructors. Who are these guys? And and two, I just didn't think ahead and go, oh, maybe this will be a big movie. I mean, I just had no idea. So I wish I could go back and say, take some pictures, but I will. Right. You know, there's a song that says Highway to the Danger Zone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So do you consider it Danger Zone? Oh, well, that, that goes along with everything else. You know, they've got to magnify it, make it dramatic to make it a good movie. I know. But do you, as like a Top Gun, you know. Do I consider flying dangerous? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't admit that it's dangerous, you're going to get killed. So it needs your respect. Right. Now, some of this, uh, and, and I was thinking about what we're going to talk about. Uh, and this is something that I've thought about over the years. A lot of the things that we did as instructors were, were, uh, professional, prof- two words that, that summarize, characterize them are professionalism and commitment. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't think like that back when I was a 27 year old Lieutenant Top Gun instructor. I didn't think about that. I just did what it took to, to do this job, which, but professionalism and commitment keep you alive, allow you to do your job well. And the trade-off is you're flying jet fighters. I mean, you're, you're coming in, sometimes you'd have four class F-14s and you'd have eight bandits fighting them. And everybody comes in, so you've got four versus eight. You've got 12 airplanes in a piece of sky. And you come in in your formations and the Tomcats or the Hornets are in their formation. And you're just sitting there. And then it's like a giant, it's just a big dogfight. I mean, that's what we did occasionally back then. Not all the time, but it, it sometimes came to that. So you've got 12 airplanes swirling around the sky between, 
you know, 250 and 500 miles an hour between 15,000 and 25,000 feet. And it is just cool. I mean, it's cool. And you're upside down. And because you've been doing this long enough, you've got pretty good situational awareness. I mean, I remember when I started and I wrote, write about this in the books, how confusing things were. But after you do it for a couple of months and then a couple of years, you just got it. Yeah. I mean, okay. So does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, I, it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it seems like a dangerous career choice, but I totally can respect why you do it. It's cool. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, one, uh, they started doing training at night. And uh, one of the things is they tell people stay in your altitude block. You know, the, the bad guys are in this block and the good guys are in this block. Now that if you were going into real combat, the enemy, you don't have altitude blocks, but for training for combat, you can do a lot of good training and staying in your altitude block. And that keeps you separated from the, each other, from hitting each other at night. <laughs> in the daytime, it's, it's visual and stuff. And uh, of course, you know, occasionally accidents happen and stuff like that. So, but they, they study them, learn from them. And if, if, if they can be prevented, you know, reasonably, then they do that. Uh, if they can't, then, oh, well. Very cool. I yeah. just, I think it's fascinating. You don't consider yourself an adrenaline junkie because no. I think most people would think that's absolutely terrifying. And I just love that you're like, <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> like, Oh, it was. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, it's interesting to think back over the people that I knew as fighter pilots and Rios. And some guys were, you know, they looked like male models and they had been, football players or lacrosse players or whatever. And other guys were smaller than me, skinny, losing their hair when they're 24, you know? And I mean, and this was before people, people didn't shave their heads back then. I mean, so just, you've got the full spectrum. Some guys were actually a little bit flabby. Other guys were bodybuilders. I mean, you just had the full spectrum. So it was, uh, yeah, it's a reflection of American society. It just, you know, these people that decide, oh, I want to fly airplanes and they do. Or, or helicopters or, you know, whatever. Uh, a couple of my friends helped me keep grounded in this also. You know, one guy had, had sold title insurance before he joined the Navy. And I write about him in the book. He's one of my good friends. And he goes, Dave, you, you need to just remember this is just your job. You know, don't, you know, don't make too much out of this. <laughs> So. so when they were filming the movie, did they like meet with you guys and be like, um, what's, what's the best type of moves to film for the movie? I mean, did they consult with you? And okay. So one thing that they did was they listened in on flight briefings. Now a lot of our briefings became classified because we talked about specific uh, weapons capabilities and stuff. But if, if you have people that are cleared in there, you can avoid that, you know, while they're in there. So these guys sat in and listened to briefings and they wrote all these notes and they heard terms that we used and they go, oh, that sounds cool. I want to put it in the script. Okay, so one that, that, uh, that got removed was we used to say uh, P sub S. It's like a physics, you know, it's like a physics notation or something. And, and it's called uh, specific excess power. And we talked about that in terms of airplanes maneuvering. Well, these guys heard how we said it and they go, oh, pieces of S. And, and so they go, you know, oh, you didn't have good pieces of S and blah, blah. And, and so we read the raw script and we go, no, no, no. And so we cut out most of that. But something that we didn't cut out is uh, going ballistic. You know, in the movie, they said you went ballistic with Penny Benjamin's, ad, whatever. I don't remember. I have not memorized the script yet. I'm working on it. I'll be, say, but ballistic was actually, if you're in, for example, an F5, you could go ballistic pretty easily. If you had your nose up and uh, you didn't have enough power and you didn't get your nose down, then pretty soon the plane would start to fall. And other airplanes may not be able to tell that you're not flying the plane. You're just falling. So if you, if you do that, you'd say, you know, uh, four sevens ballistic. That means you're just falling until you get some speed up and control. So that's what ballistic means. But in the movie, they made it sound like, uh, you know, like ballistic missiles right. or whatever. So did you have to shoot a whole bunch of different times? Like if you guys messed up a scene? And oh, oh, uh, well, the, all the scenes that I was in were airplanes. Right. And, and some of the scenes, um, some of the scenes like the officer's club scene and the pool, the swimming pool, officer's club pool scenes, a lot of those, they had actual fighter pilots and Rios. But many of them were students because they told us, uh, if you want to be in the movie, you've got to come to the set for two full days because we're going to film scenes over and over again. 
and we want to be able to use anything from either day. And we want the same people in the scenes. So the Top Gun instructors, I don't think there were any actual Top Gun instructors that were in the in those movies where you can see our faces. So we just flew the jets. We flew the, uh, and for me, the two-seat jets, I, w- I was flying the uh, black jets, the enemy. Okay. But uh, some of the guys that were in the other scenes, yeah, this is Goose, and that's my wife and me. Oh, very cool. <laughs> this is... This is a, when I was writing the book, she got, my wife goes, you got to use this picture in there. So. <laughs> wow. And my friend Russ Novak took that. I didn't even take that picture because I didn't even think to take a camera right. to, that, to that party. So. And for our listeners, that's a photo of Dave's wife kissing Tom Cruise on the cheek, which I'm sure <laughs> she's very proud of to this day. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, when we were, I was involved in filming the uh, close flybys, like when the uh, F-14s are flying by the uh, black MiG-28s. And the director kept saying, closer, closer. So we, when I would did it, we did it uh, three times. Okay. And each time got closer. And that was pretty thrilling because we were close. Yeah. And when you're going head on like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Was there any move where you're like, oh, I don't really want to do that one because you're kind of scared of it? Uh, not that I was involved in, but the guys that went up to the desert in uh, near Fallon and they filmed the overland scenes. They, the first place they selected, and, and I didn't go on that because I think it was, uh, it was right around that time I was, I was either getting married or I had to go to Virginia for a trip. I don't remember. I think it was, I think it was my, the wedding. It was like the week before my wedding. So I go, I can't, I'm not going to Nevada. So, um, they filmed, they found a location and that the jets are coming through a valley and there was a, a little mountain at the end and they go, we're not going to keep doing this because it's too dangerous. You know, we're trying to fly and do this and we don't want to have to keep thinking about that mountain. So they moved the camera and found another location. So, but they, uh, I mean, these guys were, everyone was very thoughtful and professional. And what and, about outside of the movie? Like, was there a uh, aerial move that you didn't like to do because it was kind of scary? Oh, for me? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, that was, uh, no, I mean, I, like I was telling you earlier, I, I do remember coming back from one of my later Top Gun flights when we did a four V eight pass and there was 12 airplanes. And I remember coming back to the ready room and I'm going, I was talking to one of the instructor pilots and I go like, Oh man, I said, you know, and I, and I was in one of the enemy airplanes and I had all four Tomcats in sight and I was telling him, you know, okay, I had all the Tomcats and he, he's going, well, you know, they did not see all of us cause there's eight of us. And they, you know, they might've seen five or six of us or something like that, but not eight of us. And anyway, so we're just going like, oh, well, you know, we all got through it. <laughs> I was flying a couple of times and I would see something that the pilot would not see. And so I, and you know, he would be chasing an airplane up there on in front of us. And so I could tell where he's looking and the way he's flying. And then I'd see a guy beside us coming, turning across us. And then I remember going into the debrief and looking at the tape and I'm going like, Oh man, we missed that guy by like, you know, close. That is crazy. <laughs> but it didn't happen that often. <laughs> so how do you feel about the sequel? Ah, oh, that's good. Um, I think it's great. <laughs> and I don't know, but we were talking about it in the office. We were like, is, is Tom Cruise still the, the pilot at, at almost 60? That doesn't seem realistic. <laughs> no, that is, uh, you know, and, and there was a Navy article where they said, here's how it could happen. Why well, I, I didn't read that article because it's like, you know, whatever. It's, it's not a documentary, as I've said before. But um, he, th- there were a few guys who were older who were flying, you know, for some very, some reason. I mean, it's not common, but it's, it's possible. In, in cases. And I'm not sure. I, I've talked to a couple of uh, Super Hornet uh, pilots and Wizzos involved in filming this movie, but I, I didn't ask them anything because I've also read that uh, everyone's being very secretive about it. And so I said, you know, I'm not going to put these guys on the spot. Or, or if they told me they'd go by, oh, don't tell this to anybody. So it wouldn't do me any good anyway. So, but they did, you know, they're kind of having fun doing it. And I'm going, okay, good. And I saw that, you know, little two minute uh, preview that came out, trailer, whatever. And uh, that looks pretty cool. I mean, that's, they've got some interesting scenes. So they're, they're ramping up the uh, visual, the, you know, the eye catching visals. I'm so sure the technology's improved a little bit in the past, you know, yep. 30 years. Or well, when we 40. filmed <laughs> the first movie, there was, uh, I don't think there was any computer generated stuff. Wow. And the only, Fake stuff was the uh, canopy to canopy. 
Because I was inverted. And uh, because the F-14 tails were too big and they couldn't stabilize it. And then also uh, when they blew up the planes, they, they had built, ex, you know, detailed models and they took them outside and, and blew them up. Seems like a lot of effort. Now you could just, you know, computer generate an explosion oh, on it something. Look the and same. <laughs> that, it yeah. probably, you know, I don't, I don't know if it is. I'll be interested to see what you think of this new movie. I'll have to send you an email and see what you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm not gonna I mean it's gonna have to be pretty bad before I talk bad about it. Right. I don't wanna be a spoil sport. I had my time. Let these guys have their fun, you know, and I hope it's good. So now you have written two books and you're writing your third and it's coming out in 2020. Yes. Um, both of the first two were memoirs. What's the third one going to be about? It's a memoir. It's a memoir as well. <laughs> but it's- I will say this. Um, so this book was, I mean, this was the one that was just like the plan, Top Gun Days. This was the one that I had the whole vision. I enjoyed writing it. Then before Top Gun Days, I wasn't even sure if I would write it. But people would say, "How did you get there?" So this one has the backstory, and uh, and I'm I'm uh, I'm pretty honest, or I'm honest in here about you know I I was confused by this, and I I was having you know I just tell them I was a student, and so as kind of a payoff at the end of this, I've got four stories uh, that did not fit in this in Top Gun days, and they were stories about what I did when I, my training was completed and I was capable. And so, so they're like the payoff. And so then, but both of these books, especially Top Gun days, I was very conscious that I was representing Top Gun. And so this next book is, uh, it's just going to be a little bit, you know, looser, a little bit more fun, stuff like that. I think. (laughs) Do you still fly? No, I don't. That is, uh, and that's a hard question. One thing that helped me to have closure was that, uh, late or in the middle of my career, I thought I was done flying. And I write about this in the third book. So you'll want to buy that so you can read this story. <laughs> but no, in the in the middle of my career, I thought I was done flying. And I I came to grips with it. I just said, you know what? I, I and at that time I'd had 10 good years. Like I've had 10 great years of flying and you know, so I'm good. And so then when I got to go back flying again, I said this is a bonus, you know, I mean it was it was no, it was no gift or joyride. I was working very hard and there were n- new sets of challenges and all that, but it was a bonus experience to get back in the cockpit. And so then when it ended, you know, I really said, okay, now it's over. And that was it. Yeah. It's a good ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Is there anything else you want to add for our listeners today? I don't think so. I think uh, we've covered a lot of, uh, covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. So. Super fascinating. Thanks. Oh, thanks. You all are very kind. <laughs> for tuning in today, guys. Pretty amazing story about the world's most humble fighter jock, right? Don't forget, you can meet Dave by Oberonic at the Beaches Branch Reader Con on Saturday, November 16th. You can also check out his books here at the library. We hope you enjoyed our podcast today as much as we enjoyed making it. Although Bio doesn't consider himself an adrenaline junkie, we thought his death-defying stories were pretty fascinating. If you did enjoy the podcast, please be sure to rate and review us. And until next time, I'm Gabby. And I'm Amanda. Bye, Bye, guys. guys.